Well, praise the Lord, everyone. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Hallelujah. Welcome to our Sunday morning service. Praise the Lord. We're going to get right into the word this morning. We're so glad that we're able to join you this morning via the internet, via Facebook. And we're just thankful. We're going to ask that you, if you would, share this broadcast. Let other people know about it. Host a watch party on your um, Facebook page. Amen. That's the easiest way to invite all of your friends. Praise the Lord. Let's get into the Word this morning. I got a message I want to drop into you, and I'm excited about what God has downloaded for us today. Amen. In the book of Mark, chapter 5, and I'm going to give you a homework assignment. I'm going to let you know now I'm giving you a homework assignment today. But in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 5, let's begin at verse 21. The Gospel of Mark, the fifth chapter, the 21st verse. And the Bible says this. It says that when Jesus was passed over again by ship unto the other side, much people gathered unto him, and he was nigh unto the sea. And behold, there would come one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and when he saw him, he fell at his feet. And he besought him greatly, saying, My little daughter lieth at the point of death. I pray thee, come and lay your hands on her, that she may be healed, and she shall live. And Jesus went with him, and much people followed him and thronged him. And a certain woman, which had, a, which had an issue of blood twelve years, and had suffered many things of many physicians, and had spent all that she had, was none better, but whether she, rather she grew worse. And when she had heard of Jesus, she came in the, in the press behind and touched his garment. For she said, If I may but touch his clothes, I shall be whole. And, the, and straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned about in the press and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said unto him, You see the multitude thronging thee, and you ask, Who touched you? And he looked round about to see her that had done this thing. But the woman, feeling and fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. And he said unto her, Daughter, thy faith have made you whole. Go in peace and be whole of your plague. While he yet spake, there came one of the ruler of the synagogue's house, certain people, which said, Your daughter is dead. Why troublest thou the master any further? And as soon as Jesus had heard the words that were spoken, he said unto the ruler of the synagogue, Be not afraid, only believe. And he suffered no man to follow him, save Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And he came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and seeing the tumult, and them that wept and wailed greatly, and when he was come in, he said unto them, Why ye make this ado and weep? The damsel is not dead, but she sleeps. And he laughed, and they laughed him to scorn, but when they had put him all when he had put them all out, he took the father, the mother of the damsel, and them that were with him, and entered into where the damsel was lying. And he took the damsel by the hand and said unto her, Talitha Kumai, which is being interpreted, Damsel, I say unto thee, Arise. And straightway the damsel arose and walked, for she was of the age of twelve years, and they were astonished with a great astonishment. And he charged them straightly that no man should know it and commanded that something should be given her to eat. I want to use as a topic, ministering just a few minutes this morning, divine interruptions. And we're going to learn some things out of this today. We're going to learn several things. We're going to learn, number one, what the meaning of an assignment is. Okay, Jesus is sent on an assignment when he comes back to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. We're also going to find out what it means to have interruptions in our lives. How many of y'all realize that this whole COVID-19 for many of us have, has been an interruption? And how do you respond to interruptions when they happen? You know, I'm sitting here in, 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 our, in, our, in our Make Do studio this morning and I'm looking at two banners in front of me. My daughter graduated from Tulane University yesterday with honors. Okay, well, they didn't get to have the traditional graduation, such as walking across the stage and, the, and certain things that come along with that, the breakfast and the dinner and the big celebration and everything. She had a divine interruption. Okay, there was a divine interruption. So how do we respond to these divine interruptions in our lives? 
okay? And I, that's what I want you to get today. There are people all over, all across this nation and even around the world. Their businesses have been interrupted. Their plans have been interrupted. Their goals, I don't know about you, but I, I set certain goals every year, okay? Those goals have been interrupted. Why? Because of something that's completely out of my control. But guess what? Number one, it didn't surprise God. It didn't catch God off guard. It didn't do anything. It, it hasn't messed him up any kind of way. And so I'm not going to allow it to mess me up. Amen? So we need to allow for divine interruptions in our lives. And we're going to see that this morning as we walk through this passage of Scripture. Now, I said I had a homework assignment for you. That homework assignment is I want you to also, in your, in your time today or tomorrow, read in the 8th chapter of the Gospel of Luke, chap verses 41 through 56. It's the same account, but there's some, there's some nuances and there's some things that are brought out in Luke's account that are not brought out in Mark's account because we're going to be referring to those as we minister this word this morning. So let's kind of set the backdrop here. What's going on? Okay, we need to understand that the disciples, are, are they, they, they're, they're walking with Jesus, they're following Jesus, and this is the cream of the crop. This is the 12 that he chose. The Bible says in the, in the book of Mark, in the preceding chapters, that what he did was he, after praying all night, he chose 12 disciples. He chose 12 people to walk with him. Out of all the people he ministered to, out of the 12 and out of the 70 and out of all the people that said that they wanted to follow him, he chose 12, okay? This is the brain trust, all right? This is the ones that he is going to entrust the Jesus Christ Evangelistic Association ministry to when he leaves and goes back to his father. This is the cream of the crop, okay? And so now he's, he's chosen his 12 that he's going to pour himself into, okay? They're going to be his sons in the ministry, so to speak. And then he's done something else. He has also taught them the most important parable in Scripture. He's taught them the parable of the sower. He's taught them from Mark, what we know as Mark chapter 4 about how the sower sows the word, okay? About how, how the, the, the word of God needs to be in good ground so that it can bring forth 30, 60, and 100 fold. Amen? And Jesus said that this parable is so important that if you understand this parable, you can understand anything else that he teaches. And this is the way I teach this. I, I, I teach this. I tell everyone, learn the parable of the sower and use it as an overlay to anything else that you that you read in Scripture. Understand, okay, that everything that we do is needs to be based on the Word of God, okay? And it's, it, it needs to be, and everything that we do is based on how we perceive and how we receive the Word of God, amen? Okay, so we understand that. He's taught them the most important parable, okay? And then he puts it into action. That's what I love about Jesus. He doesn't sit around and wait for you to, you know, he, when he gives you a word, what happens? The test comes. You're going to have a test. And so after he teaches them the parable of the sower, the Bible says, he, say, he tells his disciples, let us pass over unto the other side. And so they get into a ship. Jesus goes into the back of the ship, he goes to the bottom of the back of the ship, and he finds himself a nice, comfortable spot, and he goes to sleep. Now, understand something. Jesus spoke a word. He said, we're going to the other side. Can you say amen? He says, we're going to the other side. Is that a word from the Lord? Yes, it is. It's the Lord speaking. You see how simple a word from the Lord can be? It's not this great big, yea, thus saith God and 15 million scriptures to support it. It can be just as simple as it's time for you to go to the store today. Boom. Word of the Lord. Go to the store. Okay. So Jesus said, let's go to the other side. So as they're going, what happens? A storm comes. Can I tell you something? Oftentimes, when you are going to do something for the Lord, look for the storm. The storm's coming. 
You know, he didn't say if the storm comes. He says when the storm comes. Okay, the storm's going to come. And I got some news for you. Did you notice when the storm started, Jesus didn't get up and rebuke the storm. He didn't get up and he didn't do, he didn't do his Jesus thing. Okay, why? Because he fully intended for the disciples to stop that storm. He fully intended that they put into action what they had just learned from him concerning the, the, the teaching of the parable. He warned them. Okay, when, when, in the beginning of that in the beginning of that teaching, when the word comes, the Bible says what? Immediately, Satan comes to steal the word. Jesus said, "Let's go to the other side." They start to go to the other side. The storm came. The enemy came to steal the word. Notice where Jesus is sleeping at in this boat. I'm I'm, I'm, I'm getting you. I'm going someplace with this. Just hang on. Okay. Jesus is sleeping in the bottom part of the boat where the water is going to go. You know, I, use, I, I love to fish, and I've had a couple of boats. And every, there's one thing that is essential to owning a boat, okay? You get this device, it's called a bilge pump, all right? And you put it in the lowest part, usually in the back, in the lowest part of the boat, and you make sure that it flips on automatically because inevitably you're going to get water back there and you want it to flip on automatically and pump that water out so you don't sink, amen? You know, the water on the outside of the boat doesn't hurt the boat. It's the water that gets inside the boat. Come on, amen? That's what causes you problems, all right? So Jesus is in the lowest part of this ship and he's asleep on a pillow. You think he might have been getting wet. You think he might have been a little cold. You think, you, you think he would have known the storm was coming. Yes, he did. Okay, but notice he didn't get up. Why? Because he fully intended for his disciples to put into action what it was that he just finished taught, teaching them, and they were the ones to stop the storm. And of course, we know the story. They didn't grasp what it was being taught so they didn't stop the storm they had to wake him up and he the first thing out of his mouth was oh it was oh i'm i'm i'm, I'm i hope i hope y'all aren't scared i hope y'all aren't fearful i hope y'all aren't y'all aren't worried no the first thing he said was where's your faith where's your faith why because i just finished teaching you this amen and then he rebukes the storm and then the Bible says that his disciples are astonished that even the winds in the sea obey him. Amen. Well, I got some news for you. The wind in the sea was supposed to obey them. Come on. Come on. So they get to the other side. They get to the land of, of, Gadarene, of Gadara. Okay. Now Jesus is going there on an assignment. He went there for one purpose. Why do we know he went there for one purpose? Because as soon as he delivers the madman of Gadarene, what happens? He leaves and he goes back to the other side. He is beginning to teach them the importance of an assignment. My brother, my sister, let me say something to you today. When God gives you an assignment, that assignment is the forefront of your life. That assignment is the forefront of your existence from that point forth. Now, your assignment may not necessarily be something spiritual. Your assignment may not be preaching to the nations. Your assignment may not be reaching a city. Your assignment may be working at Walmart. Okay? Your assignment may be working at a particular company. Your assignment may be, be, may, 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 may be your family. Your assignment is what God, where God has placed you for you to do ministry. Many times we look for ministry out here someplace and ministry is actually right here in front of us, okay? So we need to understand and discern what the assignment is that Christ, that, that God has given us. Now, and understand, not everything that comes to you is your assignment, so you need to be discerning, you need to be praying, you need to be in the Word so that you understand what your assignment is, okay? You need to understand what your assignment is. Come on. Your assignment, your assignment becomes your ministry. Your assignment becomes your ministry. Your assignment is what pulls the Jesus out of you and causes it to go and to flow in, in, into a particular area. Your assignment is what pulls on you, amen? Okay, that's why I know 
that 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 when, when I'm ministering, if I'm in the right place, the people will begin to pull on the anointing that is in me. They'll begin to pull out of me what's in me. And I've got some news for you there. Sometimes I've been places, I've had stuff come out of me. I didn't know it was there. Amen. So the assignment, okay, is pulled out of you. And the assignment is pulled out of you. Watch this. Come on now. Oftentimes by the faith of other people. People. That's deep right there. You need to write that down. Your assignment is pulled out of you by the faith of other people. Other people will pull on you. We're going to see that in just a minute. Okay. So Jesus goes to the, to the, to get to, to the land of Gadara and he runs across the, demon, the, 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 the demoniac. And we know the story. He cast the devils out of the demoniac. And then the demoniac wants to go with him wants to return and go with him. And Jesus specifically says no. In fact, the Bible says in one translation, he forbids him to come with him. Why? Because he's planting an evangelist in the land. He's planting an evangelist in the land. He, he takes that, 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 that demonized man who's been set free, who's been delivered, who is now cleansed, and he says, you go and tell everyone else what I did for you. And tell them the great things that God has done in your life. Amen? See, Jesus never went back to that land again. But he left an impact. Can I tell you something this morning? This is how important your assignment is. Okay? You may only get one chance, one opportunity to minister to someone who comes across your path. You need to make it count. Oh, this ain't a message for babies this morning. This is a message for mature people. You need, to, you need to make your words and you need to make your anointing count where you are. You may never get that opportunity again. That person may never hear from you again. Okay, that gives new meaning to the scripture in 1 Corinthians, I believe the third chapter, where Paul said what? I planted, Apollos watered, God gave the increase. Amen. You may only get one chance to spread some water. You may only get one chance to plant that seed. You may only get one chance to watch something, to, 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 to impact someone's life. And you need to make it count when you have the opportunity. Learn to seize the opportunities. Learn to seize the ministry that comes to you. Learn to seize it and take the most advantage of it. Come on. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. Learn to take the advantage of it. So Jesus completes his assignment and he gets back in the ship. They go back across the sea. And now we're going to get it. Now we're going to get into that's all my introduction. Amen. That's the introduction. Now we're going to get into the message. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. That's OK. I got my timer going. So I know I preach long enough for you today. Amen. Don't worry. OK, so he returns to Galilee. And as soon as he returns to Galilee, he's met by a throng of people at the, at, at the shore. In fact, he's met by so many people, he can hardly get out of the boat. Okay? And in the midst of this, Jairus comes. Come on, let's take a look at this. Okay? In verse 23, And Jairus besought him greatly, saying, My little daughter lies at the point of death. I pray thee, come and lay your hands on her, that she may be healed, and she shall live. She shall live. Okay? Now, who is this guy, Jairus? Let's talk about him for a second because we need to understand who Jairus is so that you can, so that we can understand, me and you can understand the importance of what's going on. Jairus is a ruler of the synagogue. Who, what, what is the ruler of the synagogue? The ruler of the synagogue would be something we would call the president. Let's, let's put it in in, in modern vernacular, he's the president of the club, okay? He's the one who sets the order. He's the one who sets the rules. As an example, when Jesus in the fourth chapter of the book of Luke came to the synagogue and he asked for the scroll, the, one of the rulers of the synagogue would have been the one to hand him the scroll. That would have been the one, they would, they would have handed him the scroll. 
the, the scroll would have been prepared. It would have been handed to him. And then Jesus, of course, sat down and he read it. The other function of the, of the ruler of the synagogue is to do what? They keep the order in the synagogue. <clears throat> they keep the protocol in the synagogue. They keep the protocol. Okay? They're the ones who make things, make sure things go in order. They're the ones who most often, after being told by the Pharisees, were the ones who would confront Jesus and would tell Jesus, you're not supposed to heal on the Sabbath. You're not supposed to do this. You're not supposed to do that. Why? Because you're breaking protocol. So this guy, Jairus, okay, he's not some little lightweight who just happened along in the crowd. He's very important. In fact, the crowd probably kind of moved out his way when he showed up. Okay, you know how it is. If, if you're at an event, okay, let's just say you're at an event and a dignitary shows up at an event, a, a congressman or a governor or somebody of importance shows up at an event, what happens? The crowd, out of respect and out of sometimes awe, does what? They move out that person's way. So they would have parted and allowed Jairus to come through. Okay, Jairus would have had an immediate, immediate, immediate audience with Jesus, the Messiah, with Jesus, because he was considered a master teacher. He was considered a teacher. Okay. Oh, I could go off on that someplace, but we'll leave that alone today. Okay, so he's considered a teacher. So when Jairus shows up, the crowd naturally moves out, moves out his way. They allow him to come. And when he sees Jesus, he falls at his feet. Why does he fall at his feet? Well, number one, it's, a, it's an act of submission. Okay? It's an act of submission. It's an act of honor. He's honoring who Jesus is. He's honoring him as a teacher. Okay? It's also an act of worship. All right? Sometimes, you know, if you want to get some, if you want the Lord to move in your life, we need to stop being so pompous and so arrogant. Okay, even in our declarations and in our so-called faith, okay, sometimes we need to be humble and we need to be, we, we need to understand that the reason I can decree and declare a thing is because of who's in me, not because of, not just because of who I am, but it's because of the anointing and the, and the power that resides in me. So, so Jairus makes a, now Jairus makes a state, a faith statement. What does he say? He says this, he says, if you will come, and lay hands on my daughter, she shall be healed. Watch this. This is important. You need to catch this. Okay? Jairus made a statement. He made a faith statement. Now, he didn't just pull something out of the air. Okay? Jesus already had a reputation. He had a reputation as a teacher. He had a reputation as a healer. Okay? So Jairus is acting on that reputation, and he makes a statement, and that statement did something. I'm pausing for effect. That statement did something. That statement put Jesus on assignment. Catch that. That statement put Jesus on assignment. Okay, he says, if you will come and lay hands on my daughter... She shall be healed. Your words can put Jesus on assignment. Your words can pull the anointing out of someone and cause things to come to pass. Your words can pull, oh, watch this, you better catch this. Your words can pull the anointing out of you and cause things to come to pass. Words release anointing. Words pull anointing. Words are the most important thing you can ever use in your life. They're not made. Words are not made for communication. Words are made to re, are, are made to release power and authority in the earth. Words release spiritual power. One of the reasons I believe this COVID-19 virus spread so rapidly is because of the words of fear that were spoken by people, by government officials, by the news media. Okay, I'm not denying this virus doesn't exist, but I'm saying one of the main reasons it spread the way it spread 
is because of the words of fear that were released in the earth. Okay? In the same way that words of fear can be released, and we're going to see that in this passage in just a minute. Okay, one of the ways that the words of fear, the same way that words of fear can be released, it's the same way that words of faith can be released. In words of anointing, in words of power, that break and destroy and ground up the yoke that is holding you bound. Amen? So, Jairus makes a faith statement, and he says, If you will come and lay hands on my daughter, she shall be made whole. And we see what happens. Jesus does what? Jesus acts on his declaration. And the Bible says what? That Jesus, that Jesus began to walk with Jairus to Jairus' house. They begin to go together. Okay? Jairus' words put Jesus on assignment. Jesus now has an assignment. And he's going to the house of Jairus. Now, picture this. Picture this. As they're walking, this is not an easy walk. People are pushing on him. People are calling to him. I imagine there are some people taunting him. I imagine there's some people making fun of him. But there are people making demands on him. I have a sick mother. Pray for her. I have a sick father. Pray for them. I have a sick child. I have this need. I have that need. Jesus doesn't listen. Jesus stays on his assignment. My brother, my sister, if you've got an assignment, stay focused on the assignment. Oh, but something happens. The Bible says while they're walking along, a certain woman. Now, we know that word certain means something, okay? We've talked about this ad nauseum. We've talked about this so much, okay? When someone, when the, when the scripture says a certain woman, a certain man, a certain person, then that person is known to everyone involved in the, in, in the scenario. And usually when you see that word certain, it means what? It's someone who's prominent. It's someone who is well known. Okay? The Bible says in Luke 15 that a certain man had two sons. Okay? Talking about the, son, about the prodigal son. Everyone would have known who that man was. That man was probably sitting in the crowd and listening when Jesus told the story of the prodigal son. So now we understand we've got a certain woman. Okay, we've got a certain woman, and in the, in the, in, in, in history tells us that she was a very prominent woman. She was a very wealthy woman. She had to be wealthy because she had spent all of her money, all of her living on physicians. The common folk didn't go to the doctor. Okay, she was able to afford a physician. She was able to afford a doctor. And the Bible says that she went to all, went to the doc, went to more than one doctor, went to several doctors, went to specialists, and they couldn't help her. And she only got worse over time. And the Bible said she spent everything that she had on those physicians, and they couldn't help her. Okay, but she makes a faith statement, and that faith statement is this. She says this. Okay, she says, if I may but touch his clothes, I shall be made whole. Now, put a big circle around that word whole, because we're going to come back to that in just a few minutes, okay? Because she wasn't just looking for a healing, okay? Just hang on, I'm going to show you something here. She wasn't just looking for a healing, but she made a faith statement. She put a demand on Jesus' anointing. She put a demand on him. And she interrupted his assignment, going with Jairus, for her assignment. And this is what I mean by divine interruptions. There are times when, you've, when you have an assignment, God has sent you to do something. Don't ex -nay, don't blot out, don't cast aside. Always be open for a divine interruption. And this is going to be a divine interruption. Watch what happens. She makes a faith statement. If I may but touch his clothes, I shall be made whole. Now, she's different than Jairus. There ain't nobody moving out her way for her. Okay? In fact, she's risking her life coming out, on, coming out onto the street. She's actually crawling on the ground. That's why she said, if I can just, but in fact, Luke brings it out. If I can just touch the hem of his garment. Okay, she's trying not to be seen. She's trying not 
to be noticed by the crowd because she's subject to being stoned. She's subject to being beaten. She, she is subject. She's on the ground. If, they, if she's not careful, they'll just stomp on her. Okay, come on. All right, let's get real here. I tell you all the time, don't read your Bible like a newspaper. All right? So she's crawling. She's pushing her way through the crowd. She's crawling. And finally, she sees that robe that Jesus is wearing. It's got those little tassels on the bottom. Okay? Now, several years ago, people made a whole doctrine out of this, that you had to have tassels on the bottom of your clothes or tassels on a robe in order to be holy. Okay? That's not what, that's not what this is teaching. But she sees that rabbinical robe that Jesus is wearing, and she reaches out, and she touches that tassel. She touches the hem of that garment. And she pulls away. She backs away. But then she realizes something. She's not bleeding anymore. She realizes something. There's some strength coming back into her body very quickly. She realizes something. Something has happened to me. Oh, but I want you to know something. Jesus realized something happened. Okay? And the Bible says he stopped. He stopped in his tracks. He stopped walking. And he begins to look around. The disciples, they don't know what's happened. The rest of the crowd, they don't know what's happened. But Jesus says, who touched me? And his disciples go, what do you mean who touched you? You got all these people touch you. Okay, all these people are touching you, but Jesus said, no, 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 no. Somebody touched me because I felt virtue. I felt anointing. I felt glory come out of me. Oh, I want you to notice some people that God's going to send into your path that are going to be divine interruptions. Okay, and then usually, usually they're going to come when you don't have time to be interrupted. Usually they're going to come when you don't think you have the resources to help. Usually they're going to come when you don't think you've got the right words. Usually they're going to show up when you haven't prayed up. Usually they're going to show up when you haven't worshipped the way you think you should worship. Usually they're going to show up when you think you haven't prayed the way you're supposed to pray. Usually they're going to show up when you don't think you've read your Bible enough. But that, that divine interruption is going to come at the time you most least likely expect it. And it's going to put a demand on you. And that's going to switch your assignment just for a moment because Jesus and God had a reason for you to be in the place you were at at that particular time. Okay? And that's what happened with this woman. Okay? She made a faith statement. She made a declaration that, that interrupted the initial assignment and, and brought Jesus onto a secondary assignment that he needed to address. And I challenge you today, be open for divine interruptions. Be open for that person who calls you in the afternoon when you don't feel like praying. Be open for that person who knocks on your door and says, I just don't know what I'm going to do. I need a word from the Lord. And they may not even come up and say they need a word from the Lord. They may not. We had a lady one time... She used to live in a neighborhood and she didn't walk the neighborhood. She's the lady that Rhett used to always, when Rhett would, when our puppy Rhett would get out, she always went, well, he always went to her house, okay? Well, one day, she's walking down the street and she just walked up our driveway and she said she didn't know why she was coming up our driveway. She just said that she just felt that we needed to pray for her. And we did and God touched her and God healed her back and God did something great in her life. Why? Being, trust me, we wasn't feeling prayed up. We wasn't feeling like God didn't tell us beforehand, oh, gee, there shall be a lady walk up your driveway today wearing a red shirt, and thou shalt pray for her, and thou shalt see the miraculous glory of God. No, 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 that's not what happened. Okay, she just showed up, and we made ourselves available. She made, it, she, she made, she made a demand on our faith. And created an assignment for us. And the assignment happened. Amen? So divine interruptions are going to happen. You need to be ready for the divine interruptions in your life. Now, that's the divine interruption. What about poor Jairus? Okay? <laughs> He's the victim of this divine interruption, so to speak. Okay? Alright? He's the one. Lord, my daughter's dying 
And you sitting here talking to this lady, because look what the Bible says. Watch what the Bible says, okay? The Bible says that she sat there and told all the truth. That means when Jesus looked around and said, who touched me, because he felt virtue go out of him, okay? And when she came forth, the Bible says that she told him all the truth. They wouldn't just, hey, you're healed, go on about your business. No, no. Jesus wanted to hear her backstory. Jesus wanted to hear the background. They sat there for a while conversing. They sat there for a while having communication. They sat there for a while talking. They may have been there 10, 15, 20 minutes. Who knows? It was long enough for her to tell Jesus her whole story. Okay? She told him the whole story about how this illness started. She told, Je she told Jesus how she had probably went to the first doctor and he referred her to this one and to that one. Told her the whole story, told her the whole thing, told him the whole thing. And then Jesus makes a statement. Now, watch this. Okay, look at verse 28. We need, I, need, I need you to see something here very quickly before we get back to Jairus. Okay, verse 28, that word whole. She said, if I can but touch his, touch his clothes... I shall be made whole. Notice she didn't say I would be healed. There's a different word for healed and for whole. Okay? That word whole in this scripture is the Greek word sozo. It's the Greek word sozo. Sozo means to save. Sozo means to deliver. Sozo means to heal. But it also means to protect. And it also means to make Whole. My brother, my sister, let me tell you something. When she said, if I touch his garment, I will be made whole. Watch this. This is going to blow your mind. Her end goal was not for the issue of blood to stop. Her end goal was for her to get back everything she lost. Okay? Her end goal was to get back her money. Her end goal was to get back her reputation. Her end goal was to get back her prominence in, in, in the community. Her end goal was to get back everything that she had lost. And can I tell you something today? Watch what Jesus does. In verse 29, the Bible says she is healed. But in verse 34, Jesus says this. He says, you are sozo. He says, you are sozo. In fact, he does something else. He goes a step further. He goes, not only are you so-so, and I'm not speaking Greek, okay? Not only are you so-so, but you are also the Greek word su, S-E-H, or however you say it. You are so-so, su. That word su, which is the Greek word 4571 in your strong concordance, means that you and your house are whole. Oh, let me tell you, when she touched his garment, not only did she get healed, but now she's got divine protection. Now she's got deliverance. Now she's got salvation. And now she's got complete restoration in her life. And not just hers, but her household. Let me tell you something. If you, if you, if you decide that you're going to chase after God and you're going to pursue him and not let go and grab onto him and not let go, I can guarantee you according to the word of God, he will restore you wholly and he will restore your household wholly. H-O-W-H-O-L-E-Y, holy. And he'll make you holy too. Amen. So, when, when the certain woman came, she was restored completely. She wasn't just healed. She was restored. Ha! Come on. All right? Now, let's get to the rest of Jairus here. Jairus is the victim, I like to say, of a divine interruption. How many of y'all have been the victim of an interruption, a divine interruption? Okay? We started in the beginning of this message. Some of y'all listen. Some, some of y'all listening this morning, your businesses have been interrupted. Okay, some of y'all this morning, your graduations, your schooling has been interrupted. Your livelihood has been interrupted. Your ministry has been interrupted. It's been interrupted. Why? Okay, it's been interrupted so, so supposedly because of this, because of this COVID-19 thing. 
I want you to flip the script this morning and make it a divine interruption, okay? Because now God's turning around and Jesus makes this statement. While, there, while in the midst of this interruption for Jairus, okay, in the midst of this interruption, somebody comes from his house and says, hey, don't bother Jesus any further. Your daughter's dead. Let's just go home. Let's get ready to have the funeral. We got the professional mourners there for you. Let's just go ahead and leave him alone. I'm sure he's a busy man. He probably came here to go do some teaching or go heal some people that aren't quite as sick as your daughter. And besides, she's dead, so, I mean, it's over, okay? All right, what does Jesus do? Let's back up a second. Let's back up a second. Jairus' words did what? Jairus' words placed Jesus on assignment. Jesus is walking with him. The interruption of the certain woman comes, and now the negative thoughts. You see, in the midst of the interruption, what you may think is not so important, in the midst of the interruption, what happens? Okay? Doubt will begin to talk. People will begin to whisper in your ears. Circumstances will begin to talk to you. Okay? Ah, uh, you know, it's been too long. It's too late. The economy's too bad. Okay? This new normal thing, you can't adjust to it. Okay? You, you, it, it, it's, it, it, this is not the way it's supposed to be. You might as well give up, wait a while, go ahead and start over. Okay? Pick, wait, just wait. Okay? No, 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 no. No, because in the midst of all that, when the people came, the certain people from Jairus' house came and said, your daughter's dead, don't bother the master, okay? Jesus turns and says, don't be afraid, only believe. Now, there's some power in what Jesus said right there, okay? Doubt comes in the interruption, but remember your declaration. Remember what you said. If you will come to my house and lay hands on my daughter, she shall live. That was the declaration. That's what placed Christ on assignment. That's what Jesus was, was placed on assignment. Now, Jesus turns and he makes this statement to Jairus, okay? And he says this. He says this. He says, don't be afraid, only believe. That word afraid that Jesus used in that passage of Scripture means to revere. It means to be in awe of. A-W-E, in awe of. Can I tell you something this morning? Some of us revere negative words in our lives. Some of us put them up on a, pad, on a, on a pedestal and we honor them. And we make those negative words, we make those words of fear more important than what the Word of God says in our life. Oh, well, you know, I must have this disease because that's what the doctor says I have. You know, that's what the doctor said. Whose report are you going to believe? I'm going to believe the report of the Lord. You know, the Bible says that Jesus died and it looked like it was over with. But guess what? Ha! He rose from the dead. Amen? And if Jesus brings if he brings you to it, he's going to bring you through it. You need to speak the word that he's given you. I love what Abraham, what Abraham did when he went to sacrifice Isaac. He left his servants at the foot of the mountain. Okay, He took Isaac and he says, we coming back. I and the lad are going to worship. And the Bible says, we will come back to you again. Uh, Abraham fully intended to sacrifice Isaac when he went on, on, on top of that mountain. And he also figured if worse comes to worse, if I do, if he is sacrificed, then God is going to raise him from the dead because he said Isaac is the son of promise. There wasn't a plan B. There wasn't a second chance. There wasn't a back there, 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 there wasn't a backup plan. Amen. And Jesus turns and looks at Jairus, and he says, you heard the words that they said? Don't revere those words. Don't stand in awe of those words. Only believe. And the Bible says this. Now Jesus thins the herd, okay? Because you see, some people follow Jesus around, and some people will follow. Preacher, listen to me. Some people are going to follow you around just so they can watch you do things. 
just so they can see signs and wonders, just so they can say they're in association with you. I got a word for you today, okay? It's nice to have people supporting you, but not everybody is meant to go to war with you. I love the people I worked with at the sheriff's office. I did. Okay, we had a solid crew. But there were certain people that I didn't want on search warrants and arrest warrants with me. Why? I wanted somebody that I knew was going to have my back when things went sideways and things went bad. Okay, so Jesus thins the herd. He's got his 12 that he just picked a few days ago. Okay, he just picked 12 people. They're his brain trust. They're the ones he's going to entrust his ministry to. But now he's fixing to go handle something, and he only takes three with him. He takes Peter, he takes James, and he takes John. Okay, he takes those three with him. Okay, I got a word for you today, preacher. Okay, don't take everybody with you to war. You pick and choose, your, you pick and choose who God tells you to take to war, to, to war with you. Okay, so they, go to, so they go to the house, and when they walk in, they've got a whole turmoil of people, a whole bunch of people that are sitting there crying, they're boo-hoo, and they're wailing. Okay, I got some news for you. Okay, you read your Bible. This is a tradition. Okay, many of these people were not family members. Many of these people are professional mourners. Okay, you hired people to mourn at, at, at the time of death. Okay, it was a tradition that they had. So Jesus walks in and he busts up their, he busts up their, 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 their tradition. He says, why are you making all this noise? She's not dead. She only sleeps. Okay, so Jesus did two things here. Okay, Jesus, number one, broke their tradition. Okay, number two, he stopped some people from making money. Okay, because if she's not dead, you don't need mourners. Amen. And then the Bible says that they laughed at him. Preacher, let me tell you something. Minister, let me tell you something. Lay person, let me tell you something. If you want to do great things for God, you're going to have to take, you're going to have to be willing to be laughed at. You're going to have to be willing to be made fun of. You're going to have to be willing to be ridiculed. You're going to have to be willing for people to say, you the cool, you're on the family. Okay? You're going to have to be willing for people to say that. Okay? In order to do the great works that God has called you to do. And the Bible says, okay, and I've done this. I remember there was one night we were called to a hospital, and there was a little girl, she was, she was, they, they, they were saying she was dying. And so they, they called, the relatives called and asked for me and Barbara to come up and pray. And we went to the hospital, and everybody was sitting there telling everybody how bad it was, and that of this, and this, and that, and the other. And some finger pointing actually started, started taking place. It's your fault this happened. You're, we put everybody out the, out the room, except for the mom and the daddy. Put everybody out, okay? Made some people mad. Made some people, and they got upset with us, okay? We put them out the room, okay? Laid hands on the little girl. That little girl's living today and doing, and doing, and living life and enjoying life, amen? So, don't tell me. this. Sometimes you've got to get the unbelief out, okay? And you as a believer... You need to get the unbelief out. So watch what happens, okay? He speaks to the child. He doesn't pray. He speaks to the child. He doesn't pray. Remember in the beginning of this when I was setting the backdrop that when they were coming across the sea and, 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 they, and, they, and, and, and they had the storm and Jesus never got up. Jesus was asleep on a pillow, okay? Why? Because it wasn't a matter of praying. It was a matter of decreeing and declaring. There are some things. Stop praying for things that God has placed in your control. Stop praying for things that God has said, you've already got authority over this. Speak and decree and declare the word. Spend some quiet time. Get a word. And then speak that word forth. And that's what happened here. Jesus didn't pray. Jesus spoke, and he said, Damsel, I say unto you, arise, get up. And then he tells mom and daddy, get her some food, she's hungry. Amen? So, I want you to see that this morning. I want you to see that the words that people speak to you in faith place you on assignment. 
and stay focused on that assignment, but also be open for the divine interruptions because the certain woman is going to come in your life. The certain woman is going to come your way. The certain woman is going to come. The certain man, the certain child, a certain situation is going to come and it's going to interrupt and it's going, it's going, to, it's going to demand your attention. Be discerning. And if it's a divine interruption, minister to that situation and do what you need to do. Amen? Ha! Be ready for your assignment. As we come out of this, as, as we, 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 come, we, we, we come out of this quarantine time, okay? Don't go, don't come out of this the same way you went in, okay? Come out of this more discerning. Come out of this more keen to things in the spirit. Come out of this with, with more determination and more focus that you're going to accomplish the will of the Lord in your life and in this earth. Amen? Be available. Make yourself available. Let's pray. Father, we thank you today. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your blessings. We thank you, Father God, that you guard us, you guide us, you protect us. Father, I thank you that your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my pathway. I thank you that the way of the righteous is a raised highway and it's plain and you make it a plain path for me. I thank you that you're my shepherd and as, you, as my shepherd, you lead me and you guide me. And you steer me in the right direction. I thank you that I have the mind of Christ and I can think like you. I thank you that I have the mind of Christ and I can act like you. I thank you that I have the mind of Christ and I can be like you. I thank you that I have your spirit in me. And your spirit in me leads me and guides me. And it brings me into all truth. And that I can walk and I can do exploits in your name. I thank you, Father God, that you place divine assignments in my life. And I'm always open to those assignments. And I thank you also that you have divine interruptions that you send my way. And I'm sensitive to those interruptions. And I know them when they come. In the name of Jesus. I thank you, Father God, these hands. These hands you gave me when I lay hands on the sick, they recover. I thank you that these hands, when I lay hands on the demon possessed, the demons are cast out. I thank you that the words you give me are full of faith. They're full of life. And that when I speak, deliverance comes. Salvation comes. Healing comes. Peace comes. Joy comes. I thank you, Father God, that I am an instrument of righteousness. And I release your righteousness in the earth. I thank you, Father God, that I'm an ambassador of your kingdom. And I thank you, Father God, for who you've made me to be. I'm a person of destiny. I'm a great leader and a great worker in your kingdom. And I am a kingdom ambassador. In the name of Jesus. <laughs> this COVID-19 thing ain't nothing. Because I'm a citizen of heaven. And you've made me a king and a priest before you. And I thank you for it, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We love you guys. We're excited about what God is doing. We can't wait till we can meet in person again. That's coming. Hopefully it's coming soon. We love y'all. Be blessed. Don't forget the teaching on Tuesday. Don't forget Thursday. And don't forget Friday this week with Apostle Barber. Amen. We love y'all. Be blessed. Go out and do great things for the kingdom. Go out and do great things today for the kingdom of God. We love y'all. Be blessed. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye.